G'day and welcome to the potty in which I connect with some of the most influential guests from across Australia and the globe to share their very inspirational stories. I was born with cystic fibrosis, a chronic illness in which I was told would most certainly ruin my life. But like many of the incredible humans that I have on this show, I'm on a mission to prove that we aren't defined by our circumstances, but rather how we choose to respond to them. I'm your host, the captain of the ship and the man in charge, Bradley J. Drybra, and this is a lot to talk about. How are you, my friend? Hey, I'm doing super well. How are you? Mate, really good. We've just had a little um, little preamble, I guess you'd call it, prior to hitting record, reminiscing on the moment that we met at the start of the year for the listeners. That moment was an event that if you follow the podcast, you may have heard me speak about. It's called Humankind. It was a three-day speaking, I guess you'd call it a speaking summit, but to be fair, there were comedians like Jim Jeffries, there were musicians, there was just such a mixed bag. It was kind of like the kind of like the assorted bag of lollies where there's a little bit of everything that you might love. And there was just yep. some brilliant stuff happening over the course of that three days at the event. And on the second day that I spoke there, I decided to make my way over to the main stage in the afternoon to catch a couple of the conversations that were happening live. And I just so happened to sit down in time for you to make your way onto the stage. I remember saying to my partner, Soph, this is the most brilliant keynote speech I've ever heard live. And there's something about this guy that interests me that allows me to take some real actionable insight from his experience and what he has to say. And I was so dis- disappointed post keynote that there was nowhere I could access any of your story online. You're like a ghost yeah. off the stage. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you very much for that compliment. It was very nice. The yeah, I haven't I haven't posted a lot, uh, nor nor was I ever ever trying to, which is it's a funny thing in life because it's like it's deeply meaningful for me to live an interesting life. Mm. And but then you're you're like, well, why are you doing it? It's like uh, I I'm, it's part of the reason why I'm very confident that I know that I'm doing it for me because it's like I don't, I don't have to post about it. You know, I'm just I'm just trying to live an interesting life. I used to sit around, like, I used to sit around the, uh, my, my friend's house right down the street. Um, and in high school, we used to play a lot of poker. It was really how I got away with not having a job. And, and so <laughs> we'd be sitting around playing poker and every once in a while, one of my, one of my friend's dads, you know, like how the dad will sometimes like sit down at the poker player uh, or at the poker table and like, you know, buy in for a half an hour, 45 minutes, and then, you know, just drop some knowledge, drop some pearls or drop some insults that you never saw coming. You know? <laughs> and, and one of my friend's fathers was a Marine in Vietnam. And he was the funniest guy. Like he just had all these stories. And I used to ask him, I was like, how do you have all these stories? You have this like incredible life. And, and it was like, you never ran out of them. You know, you, you would never like hear the same story twice. And you kind of beg for it. You'd be like, tell that one where you were running away from the base commander and you got in a fight in a bar. And then you had to like escape that guy by running down some train tracks. And he was in a Corvette on train. (laughs) And then you, you hopped the fence to get back into seer school. And Sear School is the escape and evasion course. <laughs> so he had escaped the escape and evasion course and then gone into town, gotten a stake, <laughs> saw the base commander, and then like this chase ensued. He jumps the fence back into the escape and evasion course. And and it was like, I, we used to beg him to tell that story yeah. and he'd like never tell the story. You know, he like told it once. He's like, I've told you guys this story. I'm not telling you that story. But he had a thousand. Mm. And so you'd sit down and you'd kind of never hear the same story twice. And I used to just sit there and, and ask him, how do you have so many stories, man? That's so interesting. You're so fascinating. And, and he would, the only thing that he would ever say back is like, you're going to have a lot of stories, dude. 
you know, like go, go and live life. He's like, just go and live life and, and say yes and get out there and don't be afraid. And you're going to have a lot of stories. And it's funny now because I, after humankind, you know, I told, I, I think I told four stories. I haven't given that speech since. And I think I told four stories that I thought I was going to die. And, and that was kind of the premise. That was kind of like the, the hook lead in to, you know, here are the things that I've learned and, and here's what, you know, maybe others can take away from my experience. And, and so I was telling a friend about it after I had, had gotten back to the U S and he said, Oh, did you tell him that time that the, uh, the parachute didn't open properly? Or, you know, did you tell him that about that, that time that you, you thought you were going to die in the helicopter? And I literally thought to myself, Oh, that would have been a good one. I totally forgot all about that. And, and he was like, you forgot about that? And that was one of the moments that I've had in life where I was like, oh, I have stories. You know, mm -hmm. you have so many stories that it's like, it takes something jogging the memory loose to say, oh, hey, yeah, this crazy thing happened. And now I'll tell you about it. I, I love what you're saying here. Maybe this is why I felt like I connected with what you had to say on stage and our interaction after. Because for me personally, the thing that I've been passionate about for the longest time is story. And I had this fascination mm -hmm. as a young man, as a young fella, to want to talk to absolutely everyone I could and hear their stories. And I grew up in a household in which my dad is famous for his stories. His stories yeah. are always, you know, mum would call them the spaghetti stories growing up because it was the same stories that he'd tell all the time that we used to just laugh at and cackle at. But I had this fascination from an early age with that. And part of my life philosophy, which I've been writing a lot about recently, I tend to write a lot, something that I'm interested in. And one of the things that I've come to as one of my big lessons from this year is that for me, I believe the antidote to death is in a life well lived. And I believe that you escape death when you live so well that you leave behind stories and a legacy with the people that you love. And oh, for man. me, it's big part of my aim and focus in life yeah Whew. you're you're speaking to somebody who's got an irish german background and you know my father's side is is more the irish side and everybody you know it's it's funny when when people make the comments and it's, it's always so nice to, to, to receive a compliment that you actually really care about and and i've been told by a number of people in life man you can tell a story and my response is always like, you should be around my father or my grandfather. Like that guy can tell a story. That guy can tell stories all day long. And you'll just be sitting there crying into your drink, laughing and the whole night and he'll never stop. And you'll just be in stitches. And, and, and again, another man who's just got stories for days, you know, his, his stories have stories and storytelling, I think in the, in the, in the Scots Irish tradition and, and just culture uh, is, is, is a massive significance. And I mean, look, I, we've all seen how narratives, how significant narratives have become. Like we've kind of unlocked, I feel like in, in the general consciousness and the general collective consciousness, we've kind of woken up to how powerful narratives are and because we're talking about it a lot. And, but I, I think it's also in some families and in some cultural backgrounds, it's really, really significant, kind of like the, the oral tradition of, uh, of storytelling. And that is certainly the case in my family. Well, I guess Man, to... my, my grandfather talks about his older brother, my uncle Pete, you know, great uncle once removed, right at whatever. And endless stories of shenanigans during the great depression in Cincinnati on the South side of Chicago, growing up, not blue collar, growing up without a collar. And, and he was this guy, he was this larger than life character, a pseudo criminal, you know, like a, like kind of part of a criminal underworld at way too young an age. He's mm -hmm. like 17 and he's got a revolver in his, in his belt. And he, and he walks in, 
to where the where my uh, great grandmother would keep the bacon grease, and he would stick his fingers in the bacon grease and slick back his hair, and then grab a can. And my grandfather always goes, he didn't care what can he came out of the cupboard with. He would grab a can, and then open it and then grab a spoon out of the drawer and walk out the door. And that was the last time you were going to see Pete for three or four days. And, and he said, it was my job. My mom <laughs> would yell at me to go and get the spoon <laughs> because, because Pete was just walking down the street, eating farva beans or whatever yeah. was in the can. And he would just, he's like, as soon as he was done with it, he would just drop it out of his hand and that that's where the can is that's where the spoon is and he wouldn't care and he's like my job was to run down the street he was like i was 10 years younger than him so i was like <laughs> pete pete you gotta give me the spoon. <laughs> He'd go pick up the spoon bring it back to his mom and she'd be like you know good boy good boy <laughs> oh, oh, i love that and for me it's it's funny my favorite movie ever which people always question and ask me why is catch me if you can I don't know if you've seen Catch Me If You Can. Great movie. Yeah, of course. Of course. Feels the like reason... I watch that like once a year. On the you know, same. It's like one of those ones that it's like it's like a once a year movie. You got to watch it every once in a while just to remember how yeah. brilliant it is. And the thing that I love mm -hmm. so much about that movie, when I explain to people why it's my number one, is because it is based on a true story. And in Frank Abagnale's life, that man lived so many different lives in the one. Like there are so many yeah. stories and elements to that movie in which he, you know, goes on this crazy adventure of, you know, yeah. entering chaos and, and often on the wrong time, wrong side of the law and the stories yeah. that come with that. But these experiences of being a doctor, being a pilot, being a lawyer, being involved in all these different environments. And it fascinates me as someone who wants to live a life in which I am rich with story at the end of it. And it's a great segue because so many of the audience are probably sitting here listening, thinking, so what the hell does this guy do to get all those stories? And so you've got a few titles. The one that stood out to me and sparked the initial interest, which is much of what you spoke about on stage, was you were an EOD officer in the Navy. Um, for those of you yeah. who don't know what EOD is, that is explosive ordnance disposal, um, AKA bomb diffuser. And mm -hmm. you've worked in the venture capital space. You're a businessman in, in many degrees, the chief of staff for the company you work for. And, you know, we spoke a little bit off camera before about some of the experiences of late traveling across the country and across the world for work and also for a bit of pleasure. Yeah. But I guess let, let's go into your story a little bit. Where did all this begin? So you yeah. spoke about being at that poker table as a young man in high school and the fascination for an older gent who had been a, a veteran in the Vietnam War. For you, mm -hmm. was that the first glimpse of, oh, this could be a career for me? You no, know, I didn't you know it was deeper than that. It, I was born on the 4th of July. And, and I mean that literally. Uh, also, probably figuratively or metaphysically, I was... I am really birthed of America. And so if you, if you were to see my childhood room, which is really much unchanged, like I go back and it's like my childhood room is kind of like a time capsule. It looks like uncle Sam had a lot to drink after like a 4th of July independence day bash. And then he was wildly ill all over the room. I mean, it really, I, I think there's like 176 eagles in the room. And part of that is like repeating patterns of wallpaper. Part of that is just, there's a number of eagles. And <laughs> like, there's, there's really a lot. The whole thing is red, white, and blue. There's so many, like, it, it's just Americana. And, and so I was, I was like very much born I was not born cosmopolitan. I was born American and I was born in small town America. And so, which, which I would not say that nearly as much about myself now is that I am much, I, I think of myself now as a, as much more of a citizen of the world. I've, I've traveled extensively. I, I just traveled in my 50th country and, and I've lived overseas. I've spent serious time overseas. I did a master's degree in China. 
and 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 spent a significant portion of my kind of young adulthood in the Middle East, you know, on deployments. And but that wasn't that wasn't the me of my youth. The me of my youth was I was just a kid who wanted to be the president. And oh, by the way, that's like kind of never gone away. Like uh, that's just, that was always who I was. It was like, I was a, a kid who was fascinated by military service, who was fascinated by the history of America. And, and it's like, every kid wants to be president at some point in time. You know, they were like, you, you want to, you cycle through a bunch of things. You want to be a cop, you want to be a fireman, you want to be <laughs> military, you want to be a paleontologist, you know, because dinosaurs are the coolest thing ever. You want to be an astronaut. Uh, and you want to be president and it's like that was that was me man you know that was um that was who I was so I and and you know there was another thing my my uncle was a marine and 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 what's funny is that this I I think that this is a narrative that isn't even true but uh, I'll tell it like it is true and then I'll tell you how I don't think it is true he gave me his wings because he was a pilot and and so he flew c-130s in the marine corps and so i've got and still up in my room up on like right next to the ceiling and it overlooks my bed which is like feels so appropriate is a devil dog a, you know, like a usmc he's like a little you know bulldog wearing a usmc shirt and my uncle gave me his wings and so it's like pinned to the to the shirt of the dog are wings. And that was always looking down on me. And but that, you know, my father's side of the family is like quite American. My mother's side of the family, like, you know, immigrated from Germany uh, after the war, you know, so much less American anything. Right. And. And they were always, my parents were always like, you know, you're going to college and you're going to, you you study hard and you try your best in school and that kind of thing. So I was like, I didn't know how to reconcile going to college with going and serving in the military. And so I just thought that those things were irreconcilable and that I would never serve in the military. And then my best friend, I'm working out one day, my best friend is an Indian American, uh, comes from an Indian American family, Ravi. And Ravi and I were working out one summer in between freshman year of high school and junior, uh, sophomore year of high school. And he was tired of being fat. I was tired of being skinny. And so we're both like lifting weights and we're both like, you know, hitting the gym. And one day in between sets on the bench press, he, he looks over at me and he goes, yo, man, have you ever thought about the United States Naval Academy? And I think I had what alcoholics refer to as a moment of clarity where it was like, I could feel like the light upon me. I think I was actually literally under a light, like one of the spotlights at the gym, those big bucket lights. But I like, man, I could feel the light on me. And without, I mean, honestly, this is how it happened. Without skipping a beat, I said, I said, yeah. Uh, or I said, no, I've never heard of that. But that's where I'm going to go. And he goes, wait, so you've thought about it or you haven't thought about it? And I said, I've never given the Naval Academy, a single moment of thought in my entire life. And that's where I'm going to go. And he was like, Oh, uh, cool. <laughs> and from literally from that instant on in my life, I knew what I was doing. So explain Software the year, Naval Academy. Year. So the Naval Academy, do you study there alongside? Yeah. yeah basic it's a college. Training? Okay. It's a very, it's a very, very good college in fact. And, and so you can, you know, you can major in a whole bunch of things. And that and and that's expanded uh, quite a bit. But there's you know group one, two, and three majors. So there's 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 heavy science majors, and then there's um, more fluffy majors, I suppose. A lot of people think of them as fluffy majors. I didn't think that political science and international relations was fluffy. I thought of that as like a disciplined. You know, I I, I think of a liberal arts education, and I think, oh, that's real. And and at the Naval Academy, they don't. <laughs> Not everybody agrees with you. They're like, no, aeronautics engineers. That's like a real degree. <laughs> and, and you English majors, like that's not a real degree. <laughs> and I was like, wait, isn't that the original degree? Isn't the original yeah. degree like a liberal arts degree? 
And, and so, but that, that what you just asked me or the spirit of what you just asked me, it was very much what I thought that was my attitude, which was, you know, there is no way to go to college and, and serve in the military at the same time. But it's like, that's what the United States military Academy, AKA West point, that's what they are. They're the army's college and the United States Naval Academy, AKA Annapolis is the Navy's college. That's why, you know, I, 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 this was so confusing to me. i never understood how the Navy had a football team. I was like, why, why does the Navy play football? I don't get what's going on here. Oh, Navy is playing Notre Dame. How does that make sense? And, and, and I literally didn't understand. And, and a part of why is because I grew up in a small town in, in Palm Beach, Florida. You know, it was like a, it was a small town, it was a little small beach town. And there was no military there. So I like didn't grow up around the military. And so I didn't know what Navy was. You know, I didn't know what the Naval Academy was. I didn't know what Annapolis was. You know, and then, you know, you read history and then you, you, you figure out, wow, in World War II, like, man, a lot of these heroes came from Annapolis. A lot of the Civil War, you know, like all the generals of the Civil War on both sides came from West Point. And it's like, you've heard West Point, you know, a thousand times in your life. You've heard Annapolis a thousand times in your life. But, you know, you don't quite know what those are. And I sure didn't. <clears throat> but it was a world-class education. And on top of it, it was a absolutely ball-busting, back-breaking, brutal environment of competition and, you know, quite frankly, hazing. And it was perfect for me. I mean, absolutely perfect for me. If I had constructed a, a place for me to go and spend, you know, the years in between 18 and 22, I couldn't have constructed anything better. Let me ask you a question about that. I'm curious to know whether you think that environment was perfect for you based on who you were when you entered it or perfect to make you the man that you wanted to be when you left. Ooh, that's a good question. I think, I think I loved that you woke up every day. And it's like, I, I, you know, the, the mission of the Naval Academy, you don't question what your mission is. You don't question what the mission of the Naval Academy is. Every single Naval Academy graduate has that memorized for life. You know, the mission of the United States Naval Academy is to develop midshipmen morally, mentally, and physically, and to imbue them with the highest ideals of duty, honor, and loyalty in order to provide graduates who are dedicated to a career of naval service and have the potential for future development in mind and character to assume the highest responsibilities of command, citizenship, and government. Yeah. There, there, there is no chance that anyone at the Naval Academy is waking up tomorrow morning and going, oh, man, what am I doing here? Nope. The staff knows it. The, the, you know, all the professors know it, whether they're civilian or military and every midshipman that is waking up. That's the, one of the beautiful things there. And so everyone is competitive. Everybody wants to be the best. And yet everyone is also unified. And this is one of the things that the world is kind of lacking and, and, and our country is kind of lacking right now is like this unified, you know, we're all, Americans or we're all humans like there's so much that we share and and what we share is so much more and more significant than than what you know tears us asunder and makes us different it's just like so much more important and so we have unified goals and so everybody knows that it's like you know we're going to go and serve um the United States of America the flag the constitution we're going to you know uh support and defend and and as a result you just have all of these all of these young people who are super competitive with each other. But at the end of the day, you know, as soon as you knock somebody down or get knocked down, you know that a hand is coming to lift you back up. And then, and then somebody's going to go, you know, if you would have shifted your foot a little bit, I don't think I would have been able to throw you. And then the next time you, you don't make the same mistake. And, and so it was this just wonderful environment. And I, I gotta be honest with you. A lot of my classmates were miserable there. But I, and I was miserable in a sense, but I was one of the, 
I was one of the few that was, would be like walking in the hallways, walking the, 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 the Naval Academy yard and just going, man, how lucky are we? And I think I annoyed, <laughs> I annoyed my classmates to no end because I was one of these drink the Kool-Aid um, blowhards who just absolutely loved it every day. And, and I thought it was so special and so cool, but, but I got my ass kicked every day. Every day I was beaten at everything by somebody who was a champion. You know, it, as soon as you beat somebody else in wrestling, then they'd, they'd go, hey, why don't you wrestle that guy next? And that guy would pretzel me. You know, I'm not a small guy. I'm, I don't, I don't, I was never used to losing fights or losing races, you know, or, or losing much in anything, you know, in, in high school, you know, I, was doing well. I performed well. I, I measured up against my peers well. And you go to the Naval Academy, that's a deep, deep pond, you know, and there's so much talent there. And then you just get smoked at everything. It was awesome. And I, and I loved that about it. You know what? I there was love. always somebody we, like ready and willing. It was like, you'd hear it like down the hallway. You know, we all live in, in Bancroft Hall, which is this giant dormitory complex. And somebody would just like yell into the hallway, Hey, anybody want to go for a run? And and the answer would be like, yeah, two minutes. And and it was like, you know, or how far are you going? Ten miles. Cool. And there and people would just like pour out of the rooms, and then boom, they're going on a ten mile jog. And you know, anybody want to play football? Anybody want to do a dick? And it did not matter what the question was. The answer from somebody down that hallway was yes. Uh, you know what I love about this. So for me, we, we touched on humankind before the thing that I shared at humankind, the, I guess you'd call them the actionable insights that I've learned from my own experience. The first 26 years of my life at the time, now 27, are all linked to purpose, resilience, and perspective. For me, they are the three things that have had the biggest impact on my character. And when I hear about your experience there at Naval College, for me, it, it sounds very character defining and very good for character development. It also, we, we touched on, um, you know, Professor Galloway, Scott Galloway, I think before we hit record and, and how brilliant some of his work is. I listened to him on a podcast just okay. last week with Stephen Bartlett, Diary of a CEO. And, you know, they spoke about the, the crisis that young men are facing in particular, how we have yeah. a huge community of young men who feel disconnected, lonely, who have a lack of purpose and direction for their life. And when I hear you speak about that experience, I think that we've, we've gotten to a point in society now where everyone leaves school and the first thought that goes through their mind is, how do I go and earn as much money as I can? What degree is going to do that for me? What job's going to do that for me? What does that path look like? And I'm not demonizing money because it's nice to have, but I think you've got to build character and you have to- Necessary to have. Woods, you know. And it's- I think you've got to build character first and I think you have to go on a journey or a quest of self-discovery. And I think that yeah. for me, it sounds like the Naval Academy done a lot of that for you if it maybe hadn't already. Yeah. I, yes. There is a, there is a crisis amongst young men. I think right now, that if every young man had a place like the Naval Academy, I don't think that crisis would would exist or it would not exist in the same form. And look, it wasn't it, it was not for everybody, so I don't project that out on on everyone. But that could come in a, in a bunch of different forms. And and the most powerful thing I think was was what I said about purpose and mission. It was like just knowing that. And not everybody aspires to the mission of the United States Naval Academy. But they aspire to have a mission. And, and I think young men aspire to have a mission. And in the absence of a good one, they will take an okay one. And I think that you see that the world over in, in that young men are oftentimes the problem. And, and oftentimes, I think the opportunity is like when you have a bunch of, we used to say in the Middle East on deployment was like, you know, military age male. Like your military age male is the one who's going to be throwing the grenade over the wall towards the Americans or towards our allies. And, and it's like, 
that's a disaffected young man who wants to make a mark on the world, wants to have significance, wants to contribute to his community. And, and we've done a, frankly, a shit job with, with a lot of young men. And, and we've kind of, we've kind of, I think, made them into misfit toys or told them they're misfit toys for being young men. And, and, and the, I, I think the way we communicate a lot of things surrounding toxic masculinity is just that it's like any and all masculinity are toxic. There is such a thing as toxic masculinity and it is not good for the world, but masculinity is not in itself toxic. And the communication of that idea, I, I'll tell you, when I left the military, when I got back from Iraq, when I you know, finished my last deployment and when I um, transitioned back to civilian life, I had, a, I had a hard time with that. I felt like I was unwanted and I understood completely why so many of my friends had, had taken their own lives, quite, quite, quite frankly. I understood that because they, you, you get back and you're like, I have served the only purpose that I can. And now the world thinks I'm toxic and now the world doesn't want me and, and I'm not useful. And I've, and mean, in the meantime, I've lost my mission. So I've walked away from the mission that I was doing and now the world doesn't want me. And I can't be useful and I can't be additive. And I, I, and, and, you know, what do we all want? Contribution and significance and community and and a certain amount of certainty and a certain amount of uncertainty. You know, these are the things that, that make us tick. And, and so when I came back, I was like, if I wasn't principled, if I didn't have like a philosophical set of beliefs that, that made suicide um unacceptable to me then then i probably wouldn't be here talking to you right now and so, and for so many of my friends they chose that route because i think they probably felt felt that way how long did it take you to re-engage with that philosophy you had for your life and to you know grind your way back out of that rut oh man it was, I think, I was in Colombia when the fog finally lifted. I was on a mission trip, essentially a mission trip with a wonderful philanthropic organization called Give Power. And, and that was when the fog finally lifted for me. And that was a year and a half ago. That was, you know, this March, right? We were doing Humankind. Mm. And it was the March before that that I was in Colombia and I broke down, I had, a, I broke down. We were, we had this lighting ceremony. We were providing solar, a solar installation to power a community project in very rural, very poor Colombia on the Pacific coast. And we were having the lighting ceremony. And I just, I finally saw that I could still have a purpose in life. You know, that, that, the, that though, like, you know, even though, though I think there's many Americans that feel like they're done with me, you know, and I still feel that way from, from a, a number of groups in, in the United States right now, the kind of social groups. I was like, nope, I can still have a positive impact on the world. People are, are good and people need to be fought for and, and I can be, I am set up to be one of the people that will fight and advocate for, for this group, for this community, and I can still make a difference. And, and the fog had been lifting, you know, from, I got out in 2016. And so 2022, mm. 2016 to 2022 is how long it took to, for that. I think for me to get past that and for the fog to finally lift. And it's the kind of thing that it's like, it's little by little and then all, all at once. And it's like, even when you're in a light fog, you can't tell because all you can tell is that you're in fog. Mm. And, and then when it lifted, I like, you know, the, the last, the, the, 
the last bit of the weight was released. It's no surprise, it. sorry to, to interject there. It's no surprise to me that majority of people find purpose or meaning for their life in the service of something greater than themselves or other people. And I think that's one of the things that I've identified in my own life over the course of the last few years from being in a place at the end of the end of 2019, early 2020, where I felt very lost and, and had no, I, I'll say that I had no suicidal ideation or I had no inclination that I wanted to be done with life. I loved life and I loved the people I had around me, but I had no motivation or drive to get out of bed in the morning because yeah. life felt quite mundane. And so mm -hmm. For me, I made radical change because I felt like mm -hmm. at rock bottom, I needed to do something to move in a new direction. And for me, I found new purpose in doing something that I was passionate about that served other people. And it's really yeah. interesting. I think that's a common thread that I hear from a lot of people who have a story along these lines. I, I like what scott says about this you know i'm i'm lucky enough to to be friends with scott personally and he, i love what he says greatness is in the agency of others and and i think that there is no purpose and no meaning and no significance quite like that and and i gotta tell you i was i felt lucky to have been an officer in the military you know so this that's you know the thing with the naval academy and, and the military academy at west point is you graduate from there and you commission on the same day. So it's like, hey, here's your degree. And oh, by the way, you don't really care about your degree. Here's your commission in the military. And, and that is, is a lot more meaningful. And I really felt exactly what you're talking about. I felt like spec ops training was by no means easy. It was very hard but it was easier for me as an officer. And the reason why is because I had the guys to take care of. And so when the only hard days that I ever had were the ones where I was thinking about myself, you know, and, and as long as I was focused on their well being and what was best for them, that, that wasn't that hard of a day because I was more worried about whether they were cold or they were hypothermic in the water than I, whether or not I was. And so I was there, I was there for a purpose. And again, that like that purpose piece is huge. And when your purpose is yourself, you'll quit. Quitting on yourself is way easier than quitting on other people. And when you set that up where it's like, this is, you know, X and is my mission and Y is the group of people that I'm doing it for. That's a very powerful combination. It's interesting you say this because I was recently reflecting on resilience, the topic and how resilience has showed up and been developed in my life and where I've come across adversity in my life, where I've felt very resilient and been able to face the fear and run through it in areas where I haven't quite mastered that yet. And, and maybe I still struggle a little bit and I was trying to identify what that was. And for me, it was really obvious after a little bit of um, thought, reflection, observation, that the areas of my life or the times of my life, I should say, in which I've showed up most resiliently in the face of my biggest challenges was because I was not only recovering or coming back from adversity for myself, but there was a purpose to do it for other people. And for me, that yeah. was like my first couple marathons for charity where I had to run with bleeding lungs. I'm like, fuck, how was I so resilient at that time? But I feel fucking like pounded by anxiety and stress at the moment because oh, I was doing it for other people. There was such a service and purpose in that. And so it's so true what you're saying. I think it's so important for people to, for, you know, our, my mates and I talk about this a lot. And, you know, something that's a common theme on the podcast is develop a sense of purpose for your life. And it doesn't have to be the purpose yeah. you attach yourself to for the rest of your life, but at least for this period or chapter, know your why. The, uh, totally. 
I uh, couldn't agree more. In on the inside of my Naval Academy ring, which I'm typically wearing, I wear it every day. The I have a I have a quote from. I, I you know I don't even know the source of the quote. I I don't know enough about the source of the quote, but it was a quote that I came across. That was this gentleman who was just asking himself, "Can I give more?" And and that that question struck me so significantly that I wrote that on the inside of my Naval Academy ring. I got it engraved. Just can I give more? Love that. And and I take it off and I and I read that and and you know when I find that it's like can I give more? You know like I'm a, in any period of time where I'm just giving to myself, I'm like, well, this isn't, this isn't what I want to be doing. You know, greatness is in the agency of others. This and, is story. And when you have that, when you have that purpose and, and, it, and it's external to you, you can do incredible things. You can, my mom gave me a great gift and that Walt Disney had given her in a sense. And she used to write me notes while I was going through basic training and boot camp and she would just like write me these handwritten notes and like sneak them in um to to letters and and so i would get them and my favorite one ever which i need to call my mom after this and tell her how much i love her and tell her what a great mom she is uh it was a, a quote by jiminy cricket and it was when your heart is in your dream no request is too extreme and I used to play that on repeat in my mind. You know, when your heart is in your dream, no request is too extreme. And it was, you know, when we were on runs where I thought my legs were going to fall off, where I, when we were doing sprints and I thought, man, my heart's going to explode. And I, and I rode crew for at least a period of time at the Naval Academy. And I wanted to quit. You know, I wanted to give up. I would just start repeating that to myself. And you know, it would be a reminder that the suffering had a purpose and the purpose was growth. And the first two words of the you know, Naval Academy's mission was to develop. And that was where I felt the complete and total alignment with that mission, with that purpose during that time period. And indeed, during that entire time period of service. And this is this is part of who I am is like, I just want to develop myself. And it's all for the purpose of, I think I can help more people. If I get stronger today and I'm stronger tomorrow than I am today, I, can, I think I can, I can lift one more thing for another person. You know, the thing about development that I think we've confused in society today is people think that development and growth can come without hardship. Now, there's something that I was writing <laughs> I'm going to share something with you yeah. that I wrote during the week. So I was thinking a lot about this. And for me, there have been a few areas of my life this year that have been just amazing, gun ho just like I'm moving in a solid direction. Things are going great. And there's been one yeah. or two areas in particular where I'm like, fuck, this is challenging. And every week feels a little bit chaotic. And I was listening to Jordan Peterson the other week, a guy yeah. who I love to listen to, sometimes can't understand because he speaks so intelligently, but often yeah. for me, he's I can a deep pull, thinker. he's a deep thinker. And I often can pull some really powerful message from this guy. He's talking about order and chaos. And he said, where you have a circle that is life and one side is order and one is chaos, you have to learn to walk the line in between. And I thought I really liked that. Mm -hmm. And it made me think about chaos and the role that chaos is playing in my life at the moment. So I'll read you what I wrote. Only a fool could believe that they will endure a life without chaos and only a fool would want to. Chaos develops character and character is fate. A life well lived is not an easy life. Contrary to popular belief, peace is not a product of your ability to do nothing. Peace is found in the pursuit of self-mastery and meaningful endeavors. The road to which is often found by walking the line between chaos and order. Chaos, you ask, why would one want chaos in their life? Well, overcoming chaos is necessary for character development and a sense of achievement, both of which breed confidence. A coward can delay the inevitable dance with chaos by avoiding the challenges that encourage growth or by submitting when life throws adversity their way. But without a shadow of doubt, their efforts to avoid it will ensure they meet with chaos less fruitful and forgiving cousin 
and his name is Regret. Nelson mm -hmm. Mandela said, there is no passion to be found in playing small and settling for a life that is less than the one you are capable of living. It would be foolish to assume you achieve the above without coming to blows with your fair share of chaos. And when I think about that and reflect about that, it stands out to me that when you left the Naval Academy and stepped foot into your first day of life as an officer, I remember you sharing a story on stage about how somewhat chaotic and challenging that first day was. And I'm sure that was probably was very sad, the experience you needed to prepare yourself to step into the years that would follow. Oh yeah. I forgot the story I told. See, this is, this is a, a great example. Um, I'd love to hear I, it. And I told the story, I told the story of cleaning out Chris's uh, stuff that it was I showed up to my first unit this was after after I had gone through spec ops training through the EOD training pipeline which is a, a grueling year and a half pipeline and you know where you can't you basically can't fail a test twice you certainly can't fail a tw test twice but you have to get an 85 on every test or above and then if you fail any test twice, you're out, that's it. And so you have like, you know, one retake and that is 13 months of that 18 month period. And that's like, those aren't the only challenges, but it's this kind of mental challenge of like, you have to diffuse this explosive, go and figure out how to do it. And you've got 60 minutes and you need to score an 85 or above. And if you score an 84, then you're toast. And if you kill yourself, you know, in the simulation, if you kill yourself, like, you know, you're gone, you're, you're toast. And, um, and you get tested, you know, a couple of times a week. And then you, and then it's to the next test and the next test. And that's, uh, you know, there's something that you were making me think of as you were giving that speech. I swear I'll come back to the other thing where you were like, you were like the overcoming chaos. You never overcome chaos. You just graduate to the next level. And there's, I think that there's an infinite number of levels and so you just go higher on the scale. And so mm -hmm. the tests just get harder. You know what I mean? It's like once you've run a marathon, you run a double marathon. Once you've run a double marathon, then you run a hundred, you know, mile race. And, and so you just graduate to the next level of challenge. And there's always another challenge out there. And there's infinite challenge to be had in this world, in this life, in this universe. And one of the challenges that, that, I faced or, or an interesting day. This wasn't a unique experience. And, and as ever, there's guys who's had, a, had a harder first day than me, but the way I remember my first day of showing up to my first unit, EOD mobile unit three on, on Coronado was the pin that had just been placed on my chest, the EOD insignia, the EOD crab it's called the pin that, that had just been placed on my chest or, you know, whatever, two months before when I finished EOD school in uh, Northwest Florida. And then I showed up to my command at San Diego. It was, you know, punched into the coffin of Lieutenant Christopher Moscow when he was killed in action in Afghanistan. And so my first pin is buried on Point Loma in San Diego. And then I went to the unit and, you know, come with your orders and you're in whites and everything. And I showed up to my, to my unit and they said, you know, here's your platoon space. Here's your, here's your area. You know, you're the, the officer and the officer has shown up, you're the platoon commander. You have shown up before the rest of your guys are ready. Some of them are on deployments. They're winding down other teams. You know, they'll be showing up in the next, whatever, six weeks. And, and go down to your platoon space and start prepping your platoon space. And I went down to the platoon space and I went to my locker, you know, what was now my locker and I opened it up and it was Chris's personal effects. And so my, you know, my first day at my first unit was cleaning out the boots and extra uniforms and pictures and deodorant and razor blade of the guy who had been killed being the platoon commander ahead of me. 
And that's a, that's a sobering, you know, that's a sobering first day. And so like I collected those things and then I, you know, went to somebody else in the unit and I said, how do I get a hold of his next of kin, his wife? And they were like, I'll call her. And so I like handed that off to a crying widow. And that was day one of the unit. How does that, how does that change your feeling towards what you're about to enter? How does that reinforce everything that you've just learned? Like, is there a, a lesson that that very early experience taught you that you carried with you throughout the whole of your service and maybe even the whole of your life up until now? I mean, it was dangerous. I was, you know, I was telling, I was telling a number of stories about, about EOD and about the military and a couple of times that I really thought I was, you know, I was toast. I, I thought I was a goner and, and, and most of them in training, you know, frankly, it wasn't, it, you know, it's not all, um, you know, whatever bullets passing close to you. It's, it's like a lot of it is, yeah, I was stateside for that. I was in Alaska when that, when that avalanche nearly killed me and two of my, two of my friends. Um, you know, I was diving the, off the coast of San Diego when, when my diving rig failed and, and, you know, I, I knew coming in that it was dangerous and, and again, it wasn't danger without purpose. It was danger with purpose. You know, I wasn't going to suffer the pain of, of the training for nothing. And I wasn't going to risk death for nothing. You know, that wasn't for for my own daredevil lifestyle or, or adrenaline junkie ways, it was, I, I, I was willing to die. And I, and I think everybody in our, our unit was willing to die. I think, I think most people in the combat arms branches of the military, you have to face your mortality at a young age. And I think you've got to ask yourselves those questions long before you ever get into the situations. Am I willing to kill? Am I willing to die? What am I willing to suffer for this? And I think that that is shown in who makes it through versus who doesn't make it through, you know, in some of the training pipelines. And, and I knew, I knew what my purpose was and I was willing to die in training and that was not going to be a wasted life. And I was willing to die in war. And that was also not a wasted life. You know, one of the things you just said there about, you know, being prepared to die is a testament to the consequence of a wrong decision or a wrong move in the environment in which you existed in for a long time. Now, I've been blessed through the podcast and now you'll be episode 208. I've been blessed to host a few people who've been in service. The first was Rich Davini retired Navy SEAL. Rich wrote a book called The Attributes and does some incredible stuff in leadership. I learned a lot off Rich. I had Dean Stott, who was a special boat service and has been a part of the SAS Australia crew in the past, the TV series that is, and just yeah. uh, had some fascinating stories and has done some private contracting work overseas and really enjoyed listening to, to him. And he spoke a lot about a couple of people that were a part of his regiments that they lost in training some of those exercises yep. and you know how how the consequences of those can be fatal then I, I met a gentleman last year one of my best mates and I went to a concert in Sydney and we just so happened to you know six degrees of separation in this very large but small world we live in just so happened to sit next to a, a couple that I recognized from our local area and mm -hmm. I just started you know, having a yarn with this chap that I'd never spoken to before, but recognized his face. And he recognized me from a TV program I'd done to um, promote one of my marathon events. And so we just started chatting and I asked him, you know, what do you do for work? And he'd been in the SAS in Australia and also a part of a few special units that had operated for the prime minister in Australia many years ago. And Steve Budgen, his name, Steve and I just become mates. We got on so well that we caught up the next week and had a five hour lunch and just, you know, we're yarning for hours about all the different experiences we'd both had. 
And one of the things that Steve said to me when he came on the show to talk about his experience was when he left service and entered the business world, there was almost a level of confidence that come with decision-making because no matter how many wrong decisions he made, the consequences could never be as high as they once were. Do you feel uh, that for yourself? Yeah, a hundred percent. I, and I, and I say it regularly. I say it regularly to my business partner where, where he, you have the volume turned down, you know, for the rest of life, I think when, when you faced, you know, when you faced bombs or bullets or, or, or just, you know, when you've, when you've, uh, dealt with your own mortality a little bit. And this was one of my points in humankind. I said, Hey, we, we've all got a death sentence here. Like none of us make it out of here alive. Okay. It's just a question of when. And so, you know, death is guaranteed, but life is not kind of, kind of attitude. And, and so if you, if you don't keep that in mind, if you don't keep in mind that we all face the kind of the, the, the danger, the danger of a sudden end. Um, you're missing it. You're, you're you're missing something. And so, when you when you face that kind of level of consequence, the intensity of the rest of your life does get turned down, and and you have a new baseline. And so, I I say this to people regularly. I was like, nobody's going to die here. You know, nobody's going to die whether if we don't sign this contract or if this lawsuit happens or you know whatever it is so much of what we deal with in life are such small potatoes and and if you keep perspective perspective is a hell of a thing we're all going to die one day and that this is this is one of my biggest points in the humankind conference and in, in what i was speaking about we're all going to die so whatever little fear is controlling you right now today, drop it because there is a much bigger fear on the horizon, which is you're not going to be here one day to have the choice. It's going to be done and dusted. Your life is going to be over. It's going to be baked. And the story is going to, you know, read, um, you know, kind of like in that moment of truth, I wimped out. Yeah. <laughs> like don't let that be the story. And and this is what we were talking about kind of uh, before we hit record. It was the thing that used to be said in the United States Navy was never again volunteer yourself. That's what Navy stands for. Never again volunteer yourself. And my attitude was always raise your hand because you're going to look like an idiot for 5 minutes. They're going to make a fool of you. And then they're going to let you do something cool. And yeah. so it's like, always volunteer yourself, always raise your hand, always go the extra mile. And, and that's the stuff of, of, of a life well lived. That's the, that's an interesting thing. And what you wrote, it reminded me a lot of the man in the arena and a, and a thousand speeches yeah. that Teddy Roosevelt gave. And again, coming back to, coming back to my narrative is like, that Americana, Teddy Roosevelt is Americana. Love Teddy Roosevelt. You know, when he was, in, when he was post-presidency, he was already a legendary president. And then what does he do? He goes and he charts and navigates one of the like five remaining rivers on planet Earth that had never been charted and navigated. So it's like, it's like Barack Obama today goes, hey guys, I'm going to Mars and I'll be back after I chart it. And then he goes and does something that nobody has ever done before. And it was so unbelievable that I think it was even the National Geographic Society had like, they were like, we can't publish this. And they were like, nobody's going to believe that you did this. And he's like, I did it. And I did it with my son and people died and it was crazy. And he, he, uh, he, he later got sick. But Teddy Roosevelt does a lot of speeches and he's, you know, his autobiography, there's a lot of writing that he, he did in his life. Voracious reader, voracious studier, and, and a guy who lived. He was a guy who lived. He said yes to life. He said yes to the challenges. 
and uh, and he talks about living a strenuous life and and about what a what a gift that is. You know, there's a few things that I wrote down from your talk, having both remembered them and rehashed on them when I rewatched <laughs> it in the last week. And one of them was death is a guarantee, life is not. Yep. And then let let me hopefully hit the nail on the head here. Your philosophy for a good life, I think, boiled down to five things. The first being face your fears and control them. Face your enemies. Seek adversity. Believe in yourself. And this is my favorite. Hear the call to action. Your life is today. And for me, that hits the nail on the head with what you just said. Being able to go, man, death is a guarantee. Life is not. So what am I going to do today? Am I going to understand that? Am I going to conceptualize that? Part of what has been fascinating for me this year is one of the best things I ever did was at the start of this year, I sat down with my two closest mates and we, every, every Wednesday, we catch up for a run, a swim and a coffee. And it might just be like a 5k run. We jump in the water after in the ocean. We live on the coast here. It's beautiful. We go have a coffee yep. and we might chat for two hours. And I'm very grateful that I've got a, a lot of really good mates in my life that I can have really deep, insightful conversation with. They're just very decent human beings who have a zest for life and a yep. zest to get better. And so we were sitting there having these conversations and I said to the guys one day, they'd both been on the podcast separately in the past, just sharing their stories because they've both done some fascinating things. And I said, hear me out. I feel like it would be really cool to share the conversations that we have over a coffee like this, just for any guy in their twenties, thirties, who is developing a connection with mates, setting out to achieve some things in life and trying to understand purpose, resilience, perspective, the quest that is life and all the challenges that come with it. I feel like maybe they'd, yeah. they'd get something just from listening to these. Even if, they, even if they don't learn, they'd maybe feel good about the fact that everyone has the challenges that they face. Right. Yeah, right. That we're all facing the same thing. A hundred percent. And so we sat there and the boys said, love this idea. What should we talk about on the first app? And I just watched, um, have you ever heard of Dr. BJ Miller? No. Fascinating human being. He's done a TED talk. It's it's so <clears throat> inspirational, this talk he does yep. for TED. So he was a Stanford college athlete. I believe he was a swimmer who was just mm -hmm. fucking around with a couple of mates one day, climbing on top of trains, got hit by an electrical wire and it blew his arms and legs off. Oh yeah, um, I've heard of this. Yeah, and he went through a massive recovery and what he found was one of the biggest challenges for him was a recalibration of purpose, you know, mm. forming new purpose in his life after the purpose of being an athlete and being physically who he was before had completely changed mm. and would never be the same again. Right. And I seen this guy on Chris Hemsworth put together like a docu-series on Disney. It was called Limitless. And it was <clears throat> Was that any good? Was that cool? Um, I didn't watch every episode, but I watched a couple and I found it cool seeing some parts of it. Some parts mm -hmm. were were probably built a little bit for novelty, like some of the fear challenges and whatnot. And you don't know how much of it is for camera, but I guess Chris is a pretty fit fella. So I can imagine that a lot of it he probably enjoyed. Yeah. But the, yeah. the final yeah. episode was on death. And Dr. BJ Miller runs this, um, I'm going to call it a retreat because it seemed kind of like a retreat, but a lot of people who are in the later stages of their life would go there and prepare for death. And death mm. was death was seen from quite a positive perspective for what it teaches us about life. And when I was thinking about this concept of death, as someone who'd grown up with cystic fibrosis and had what I would describe as maybe a, a few brushes with the question, is this my final moment? You know, am I dying here? Is something seriously wrong? I questioned how deeply I'd actually thought about the sentiment of death and what it taught me about life. And it made mm. me curious as to if I was told by a doctor that tomorrow was my last day on earth and mm. I had to write my own eulogy, what would I write in it? And what would it make me think about the gift of life that I have? And so I said to my two mates, Joey and, and Ferns, I said, 
boys, let's write our own two to three minute eulogy, share it yeah. and talk yeah. about what it taught us about life. And so, Oh man, that's a good exercise. It was the most emotional thing I've ever done in my life. I read it and was a bit emotional reading it as I wrote it out. But when I shared it on the podcast, mate, I was a blubbering mess. Like from about a minute and a half in, I was in tears. My face was red. It's the ugliest I've ever looked on video, which isn't hard for me. But it went crazy online, right? It went crazy online. And for the next six months, I was every interview I did as a guest, everything I'd done as a speaker, I was on TV, it was, it was about death. And so I yeah. thought about this topic a lot. And the thing that I come to terms with is that, man, we're so scared to talk about it. But I think in talking about it and understanding it, we break through the barrier of existing and we give ourselves mm-hmm. the freedom and the gift of actual life. Actually yeah. living. I think, I think something is lost in my life by, you know, and it wasn't like, you know, like not every day was facing death. Some days were just like, you know, in, in the military, in the EOD unit, you know, some days you walked in the office and you had paperwork to do, <laughs> like, but, but the, there was something, there is something that has been lost and I still see kind of some extreme experiences, like a couple a year. Um, I, I climbed Kilimanjaro with some friends recently, you know, in the, in the last three years, that's not all that intense to be honest with you, but it is still like a transformative experience of like, you know, just, it's a tall mountain. And <clears throat> I, I recently went wing walking, which is like where you're, where you walk on the top wing of a biplane. So it's like you climb out of the cockpit and then you like go to the top. And there's basically like a, a an aluminum rod that you go and you basically tie yourself to and then you give the thumbs up to the pilot and the pilot goes mm, and starts doing somersaults and barrel rolls and like negative G's. So you're just like hanging, you know, like upside down <laughs> negative G. And uh, I go heli skiing every year with a group of friends, which is shockingly intense. And I, I lose something when I don't, do things where there's a real consequence Mm. you know there's an there's a real immediate intense consequence and it's one of the i'm not sure how much i actually like mountain biking versus i like that aspect of mountain biking it's forced meditation it you don't get to like oh i'm gonna think about i'm gonna lollygag and and daydream no you're like making tiny adjustments the whole time so you don't fall off a cliff and that's the consequence and th- and there's some in, you know intense hiking that can be done and mountaineering that can be done that it's like look one false step and you're going off of that fall and that fall is not going to result in a happy uh danny at the end at the bottom you know it's going to be a broken uh twisted re- you know piece of wreckage and, and what I found is that when I don't face, you know, kind of existential risk and danger with some regularity, I lose something because then I get into this fearful stage that puts me in like, a, you know, oh, I, I you know, oh, I, I should, I should be careful, you know, I, I, oh, I should be worried about something. And it's like, no, again, death is guaranteed. Like, no, none of us get out of here alive. And so death is not this ultimate evil to be avoided it's like no or at least that's not my conception of things and that's not how i approach things it's like what can i do while i'm here with this time that i have been given to live an interesting life to learn as much as i can to give as hard and as much and as significantly and all of those things they're not born out of this fearful risk averse attitude they're like i i you i think it's like you have to come with like and i accept the risk of life i accept my own mortality and mortality is not some great evil it's an adventure at the end of this adventure Mm. and who knows what it holds 
but you, you have to be brave in the face of that. It's a challenge. It's really interesting because I think that the, what we have to grapple with in modern society is that because we used to prehistorically live lives in which we, in some degree, face death every day, like to eat yeah. and to feed your family or your tribe, you had to yeah, get Yeah, there was a the lion hunt. right over there. Yeah, for yeah. sure. And it's kind of like, that's a yeah. And a stomping fucking... woolly mammoth was food. Yeah. And you're kind of like, that's a pretty fucking easy way to think about how <clears> mortal <throat> we are because you're faced by it every day. But I think in the comfort that we have now, we've kind of lost touch with the fact that life is this one-time thing. Like one of my favorite ever quotes that I share when I step on stage is, the Confucius quote that every man lives two lives. The second begins when he realizes he has just one. There is something about that life realization that empowers us to then go on and actually live life and do something about that fact. But I often question why it takes us. And this is why this topic of death has become so fascinating to me. Why does it take a brush with death or a life realization or losing someone you love or having something important taken from you to remind you of that fact. Well, it's because we exist in such comfort now. Oh, we really do. And, and, and if you think about, I was thinking about this, I was talking with a friend and he was like, he was like, man, when I started dating my girlfriend, you know, my current girlfriend, seriously, <clears throat> this is him saying this, I'm horribly single. Um, he is, he's, <clears throat> he's saying, I really, there was like this weak, or two that I just tossed and turned because it was like, I realized that I was with the woman that I think I'm going to pair with and I was trying to figure out whether or not it was moral and ethical to bring children into a world that I think is going to be so challenged with, you know, are we going to be fighting machines in, in 10 years? Like is, is AI coming for us? Is it going to replace humans? what kind of the weird divided world are we bringing our children into? Um, you know, uh, you know, he was just citing all the problems. Right. And, and I was like, man, I agree that I think about that all the time. And, and I've got a nephew and two nieces and I look at them and I'm like, man, are we going to hand you a world that is just an absolute mess? And and why and you know just just asking these questions and you know the other day i think i had my own kind of breakthrough on this and and i think that the answer for me is no generation knows the challenge of the generation that follows them and and you know what we're people who come into the world right now are coming into a pretty great world you know our understanding of science and technology is, is better than it has ever been. You don't die of black plague anymore, right? It's like, we have antibiotics that we have eradicated smallpox. You know, we have done incredible things to like, I have laser eyeballs installed, right? I would, you know, like we would be wearing glasses which are themselves, like we would not be able to see clearly if we were four or 500 years ago when we were glasses invented, 1500, 1400, I don't know. But, you know, like that's incredible. These are, this is an incredible time to be alive. And just because there are challenges doesn't mean, and there are new challenges. That's every generation that we've ever had is that, you know, my children or your children or, or the generation that follows us, th they're not going to live a life of scarcity. Why? Because 3D printers and weird biological fake meat and real meat and biologically processed meat that didn't come from a cow, but eh, sure tastes like it. And it's chemically identical. And it's like, they're, they're not going to live. We're already not living the life of scarcity, at least not in the first world right? Or the developed world. And, you know, that right there is really interesting because there's challenges associated with, a, with resource, uh, plentiful resources, is that we have moved from scarcity to the antithesis of scarcity. 
Mm. And there are psychological challenges associated with that. And to think arrogantly that it's like, oh, well, I, my children are not going to be able to handle that or the next generation won't be able to handle that. It's like, that's not your decision. Your decision is to raise them the best is, is first of all, to engage or, or disengage from that like biological process of passing genetic code and, and the force and vigor of life to the next generation. That's a decision. And then the next decision is, are you going to raise them well? Right. And if you raise them well, that's all you can do. And the world is going to provide its challenges. And if you do a good job with parts one and parts two, then they are going to take those challenges in stride and they're going to figure out how, how to de defeat Terminator or Skynet. And they're going to figure out how to deal with the, the life of plenty and how to find scarcity and how to find danger because danger is important because it's only by facing death or, or by facing danger that we approach our own mortality because otherwise life is really comfortable and you see it. You see how hollow that is. And I like what Jordan Peterson, where, where he talks about this is, you know, there's something about masculinity and this isn't toxic. It drives me crazy that I think it's seen as it is because this is the, the entire portion of like martial arts, right? The, like the point of martial arts and every martial aid, like, you know, Chinese martial arts movie is the same, which is you learn how to do violence. You learn how to fight so that you can only use it for defense, right? That is the whole point. And it's like, and every martial arts movie is always the same. It's like over the top about what a douchebag somebody is before the martial arts master will engage. You know, it, it like, it has to, they go so far to prove that it's like, this guy's a douche and he needs to get his ass kicked. And that's the only reason why I'm actually going to judo his face. And and I, I think that that's overblown because it tells a simpler story. But what we're really going for, and, and, I, and this is the part that I like what Jordan Peterson says, he goes, being unable to do violence, being unable to, to face death is just weakness. It is not restraint if you can't do it. It's restraint and it's laudable if you can and don't. And, and so there is something about masculinity that is, I think, supposed to be, you're supposed to be a monster or you're supposed to be capable of, of monstrous deeds. And in that, in, in, in the same kind of way that it's like, there's this facing death, there's this facing danger. And in doing that, you, you learn the valuable things. And the and the the impressions that that gives you are good. It's so true. And the first time I ever heard Jordan speak about this was on Jocko's podcast, and I believe the analogy he used was better to be a warrior in a garden than a gardener in a war. And he spoke about yeah. the fact that a weak man is a more dangerous man because he will stab you when you have your back turned to him. A strong man yeah. who is capable of violence will choose to use it only when he needs to. And I think it's so bang on. And, and to what you were speaking about before, when you spoke about the world that we're moving into and that we don't know the challenges, there's literally something I read. I've just pulled it up here on my phone a minute before I got on this Zoom with you. Mm. It says, I got bored with people saying, this world is shit. It's kind of like when people say, oh, this traffic is so bad. You are the traffic. You can sit there and be like, oh man, the traffic was horrible, but I'm sorry. I'm sorry I was late. It's like, you are the traffic. You're in it. Without you, there would be no traffic. So if you're sitting here being like, this world is shit, you are the world. You have to take responsibility. So focus on making sure that everything you're doing is making the shit a little bit better. And, and yeah, that's, that's the thing. It's like, we're responsible for that. One of the things that my mates, one of my mates is- no, That's the Gandhi. Be the change you want to see in the world. A hundred percent. You know, don't just like weakly call out the world. Ah, this is garbage. And it's like, okay, well, what are you? What have you done? And have one you, of my you mates- you really committed yourself to making it better? Because if you have, then great. You know, but if you haven't, then it's like, it might be time. 
one of my mates, Foons, uh, one of the gents that I was talking about before, he says all the time, it may not be your fault, but it is your responsibility. And it's like, yeah. we all have a part to play in this. Right. And, and that's why yeah. I'm, I'm always fascinated to have it. It's, it's partly a big part of the reason why I started the podcast, because there were people like yourself who I looked at and thought the world is better for having them in it. And I should have a conversation with that person that connects their philosophy to someone who may need it. That's, that's um, nice of you to say. That's nice of you to say. I, I you know, I'm, I'm pretty recently only out of that time period where it's like, I didn't, I didn't believe that anymore, you know, uh, as I was describing before. So it's, it's nice to hear somebody say that. And, and we don't, we don't do a good enough job. I think we don't do a good enough job kind of celebrating modern heroes and, and what, what good community builders look like and stuff. People who make a small difference in our communities. We're, we're not, we're not, we're not celebrating that enough. Yeah. And, and we're so, and, and we're in, in the United States right now, we're so quick to tear everybody down. Like if you got a statue up, if you're put on a pedestal for five seconds, it comes getting, it, it just gets torn down. And so the only people left on pedestals are like Taylor Swift. And it's like, yeah, Taylor Swift is, is speaking wonderfully to the spirit of a generation. Like you admit that may be, but it's like, what has she done for the community? And and there's a there's a community leader somewhere here in Austin who is doing a lot of old, admirable things. And like, are we celebrating that person enough? And and are we holding them up? You know, it's like so many people, uh, the heroes of, of the next generation appear to be like YouTubers and, and Instagram influencers. And I'm like, oh boy. I don't, I don't know that this has a lot of substance and I don't know that these people are really thinking about giving to a community of people or, or they're extracting from that community. I don't know. Maybe, maybe they are. And I, I don't see it somehow. And somebody just needs to correct my thinking, but I, I, that is one of the things that I worry about. And I think about how am I giving to my community and, and how is my work giving to my community and, and what am I going to do? And, and, I, I think that the question of like, what is the best use of me <clears throat> is a really important one. And then, and then again, coming back and, and, and writing that into, and I rewrite my personal mission statement every couple of years. <clears throat> what is my mission in this chapter of my life? <clears throat> I, lo I love that. And introspection. I think that that's a super, super important for us to think about. And I think if, if a lot of us thought more about that, we would have less, uh, like less dread. It's interesting you say this because a theory or, or not a theory, but a thought rather that I've been sitting on a lot lately comes from a gentleman who is operating out of Austin at the moment, Chris Williamson, who is a brilliant podcaster. He's got the modern wisdom podcast. He's one mm. of those guys who, as he so beautifully explains, was in the um he was like in reality tv and then he realized just like what the fuck am i doing this isn't me i'm just yeah. playing the playing the character that i think will be liked and like this isn't who i am and and he went and built a business and then he stepped into this world of podcasting and he's he's doing brilliantly he's one of the bigger podcasts in the world but he's so educated and he shares such insightful such insightful conversations, but also just knowledge with the people who tune mm. into a show. And a lot of them are men. And I think it's really important. We need those good role models for men. And one of the things that he was speaking about on a recent podcast was what is the next movie that isn't Transformers 10 that the world needs to hear that will make the world a better place. And I was thinking about this concept in regards to what you just mentioned about the world that we live in and how the role models have become the YouTubers and the influencers. And I was thinking about this recently because I use social media and sometimes I spend way too much time on it. And I've thought, yep. would society be better without this? Now, what I've come to terms with is that maybe it would, but it's not going to go away. It's here to stay. And every day technology becomes more ingrained in our life. So if I think about 
that theory, what is the next movie that isn't Transformers 10 that the world needs to see? I think who are the characters that I can sit down with and have a conversation with that use the technology we have on offer through podcasts, through social media to communicate really important and meaningful messages with the world. Because if this is going to exist, why don't I do my little part of making it a whole lot better and a whole lot richer in the knowledge and the conversations that are shared on it for people who need to hear it. And it's like, I think that's the, that's the attitude we need to take towards society that we live in. Yeah. And yeah, I agree with that ownership. Uh, what I hear you saying is, is taking ownership and, and taking action and, and with some combination of action and ownership, you can, you can make some kind of a difference in the world. The, <clears throat> I suppose what the idea that we've been dancing around is, that, you know, there's a really pretty interesting book called Wanting and it's on mimetic desire. And, you know, there was a gentleman, uh, I think a, a French mathematician by the name of René Girard, who uh, wrote about mimetic desire. And I think that's what we're actually talking about is like, you know, the, the idea that we are the sum total of the five people that we spend the most time with. And, and, and that sense of like community matters, who you spend time with matters and, and, and also who you look up to and who society looks up to and regards as their heroes, you know? So it's like, if in London, in the 18th and 19th centuries, you put Nelson, Lord Nelson on, you know, display in a, in, in one of the most prominent public places in downtown London, uh, is like, you're telling your citizenry, this is a great hero. Of, of the British empire. And, and he, you know, he gave himself for the victory at Trafalgar, uh, at Trafalgar. And, and that says so much about a society in a given period of time, who are the society's heroes and who are we celebrating? Because when you orient yourself, when you like where you orient your eyes as a human, I think tells us a lot about what we think about. And then what we think about becomes you know, what we action, what we action becomes our habits and our habits become who we are. And so, you know, you got to pay attention to where your eyes are going. 100%. And that's, you know, you just spoke about, we are the sum of the five people we spend most of our time with. My, I, I believe in that so much. And I'm so blessed that I am around some incredible people consistently. The one thing the one rhetoric that I have for that is I've heard people use that as a cop out. Oh, well, I'm around some pretty average people and that's why I'm underachieving. It's like, <laughs> no, you need to take ownership of the fact that like you have the choice of who you surround yourself with. You know, when, if, when if you're you the smartest point, person in the room, find a new room. <laughs> if, like, <laughs> if, if you're, I, I, this is exactly what I, I, I suppose I was saying about loving Annapolis, but also loving the special operations community, loving the groups of people that I've been able to find in the civilian world, although it's quite frankly, a lot harder in the civilian world. I found it a lot harder in the civilian world to find people that are really driving, that are thoughtful about who they're becoming and why they're becoming that person and, and how they're spending themselves. And, but you can find, you know, you can find good people anywhere. And, um, that's what I loved because there were all these people you were never the smartest person in the room you were never the fastest person on the run you were you could never throw the ball the farthest you 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 were never the most high integrity or principled person you were never the most you know resolute or resilient there were amazing people that were joined together and this is what society can be Society can be this. We can achieve this where it's like we are, we see each other, you know, and this is the motto of, of the United States, e pluribus unum, which is from many one. We can see ourselves as a collective and it is our superpower. Our superpower is the ability to compete and collaborate. We compete to make each other better and then we collaborate 
to do incredible feats. Mm. And there is a way for us to make a better world. And, and, you know, number one, we have to believe in it. And then number two, we need to do it on a micro scale, right? We need to activate the individuals. And if we do this on a micro scale, if you and I do this, you do this in your community, I do this in my community, then, then we've just multiplied ourselves, you know? And that's not to say that you and I are these wonderful people, but it's like, it's, it's small communities, small groups of people making themselves better in that kind of way that makes the world a better place in time. It's not top down. It's not all like we're waiting for the government to do something. We're waiting for this like magical leader to appear. The magical leader already showed up. They already told us all the things. We've already learned all the lessons. The world has been around for a long time. It's, it's, it's you being a good father, son, teammate, member of a community. And, and if you do that on a small scale, the world just slightly becomes a better place, which is exactly why I clue in on like, you know, who is the small community champion you know, on this block? Mm. And it's like, I, I think we did a better job a generation, two or three generations ago, celebrating that person. And now, uh, you know, <clears throat> we celebrate Kim Kardashian or whatever. It's, it's like, man, I, I worry about where we're going, where we're oriented mimetically, if those are the people that we're paying attention to. For me, it, what sums up exactly what you said there, it is the snowball effect of intent backed by action in our everyday lives. No matter how small that may feel, just how we show up every day. It's a mm -hmm. choice. It's a choice. Man, I could I, sit here and talk to you forever about this stuff, but I'm conscious of your time. <laughs> We've been here for two hours. Yeah. I can't believe that. I can't believe that. It's been fun. It flies. It flies. Is there a, like a, a sign-off message you'd like to give the audience, a, a last bit of parting wisdom? Oh, man. I don't know that I, uh, you know, I don't think, I'm not sure that I think so highly of myself that I have, um, wisdom to impart but I will say something that I've been focused on lately is I've, I've had a number of funny interactions with people um, and I've been trying to multiply the number of funny interactions that I've been having with people and so like I was just walking down the street kind of like a busy morning you know I was rushing to get someplace and <laughs> I just had like a three-person interaction there was uh, a woman walking towards me uh, and crossing the, the street and, and I was crossing in the opposing direction and this gentleman kind of came up and it was kind of like one of those uh, ambiguous situations where it was like you know who's got the right of way you know this gentleman was stopped there's no crosswalk generally pedestrians and so we were all just kind of sitting there like in this you know standoff <laughs> it's like a western standoff where everybody was like kind of being polite to the other person and then the girl got embarrassed and then started to walk kind of stutter stepped and then did this funny little jog of like, Oh, and covered <laughs> her, it covered her face with her hands because she was embarrassed about it. And it was, it was funny <laughs> in itself. And then I like made eye contact with the guy in the car. And then I did the same thing crossing the street in the other <laughs> direction. And he <laughs> started cracking up I started cracking up we stood there and like shared this moment of laughter together and then like you know just waved he went about his day I went about my day but like we shared this moment of light of levity and I'm trying to create as many of those as I can and I've had a, co a couple of them recently where it's like, I, I just, I'm going to try to make as many jokes to strangers. You know, like comedy is a hell of a thing. It's an it equalizer. It's a leveler of playing fields. It's a secret weapon that nobody sees coming. And it's a special, it's just like a special thing that we all get to enjoy. That it's like, life is so ridiculous. It's so absurd. It's such a game, you know. And when you get to share that with another human being. And so like, that is... 
I, I suppose what I'm sharing is the challenge that I have with myself right now is how many silly moments can you create in the next week where you laugh with a complete stranger and then high five and then go about your lives and that's it. You have a single serving of, of funny sugar and then you just move on. And you, and it's amazing how, what light that has brought me just doing these little silly things with people, making a silly random joke for an audience of one and then moving on. And it's honestly, it's made me a happier person in the last, whatever, two weeks that I've been doing this. I love it. I love it. And it just speaks to the power of just a smile, you know, and, and it's something I say all the time is that I, I look to the older generation and I particularly try to do this when I see the older generation out and about who I somewhat feel as though they're losing a little bit of faith in society yeah. and the way that we're moving yeah. is I try really hard to smile and say g'day to everyone yeah. I walk past because I just know that that has just the, the most little bit significant impact on on their day and their faith in humanity. It's it's amazing the impact that you can have on one person's day and what that can do for that person. You know, like if you, if you, it's, it's like the pay it forward, you know, mentality of like, I, if I just give three smiles to three people today, you mm. know, just with little tiny things, just by saying hello, just by acknowledging them, by holding a door for, you know, and, and delaying my day by an extra two and a half seconds random act of kindness, buying somebody a coffee, you know, whatever, whatever those, those tiny things are. It's like those little things, it's easy to underestimate how, how small things can, uh, where big things have small beginnings. Yeah. I love that. I love that. Sure. Daniel Glenn, it has been an absolute pleasure, my friend. It's been very, for me, very rewarding to, know that the email I sent in hopes that I'd somewhat be able to connect has led to an incredible conversation. Um, what you'd call an, an overdue catch up because we got a very small moment to chat backstage at humankind, but all mm -hmm. in all, um, a great introduction to a little bit of who you are, hopefully a little bit of who I am. And, you know, for the people listening in, watching on, um, a whole bunch of, of really valuable conversation that I think they'll take a lot from your experience and your messages. I hope so. And I'm here for it anytime. And please send me that, that quote that you or that uh, little bit of writing that you did. I want to reflect on that more. I, oh. I'm going to go get coffee tomorrow morning and I'm going to go and read that and, and think on it. So I hope this is, this is the first of uh, a number of check-ins and conversations and, and, and I'm game for it, man. I, I think you're a, I think you're a stand up guy and I respect anybody who's living with intense introspection and intentionality and and it's like it's an inspiration to me when i find other people that are like man i i i stress a lot about the person that i am and the person that i want to become and and my biggest piece of advice i'm i'm in a mentorship relationship with my boss and my partner we're boss partner brother friends which is bizarre and and I'm and a mentor. I have become like kind of a big brother to his son. He's, God, he's a fucking great kid. I love this kid so much. And I also want to punch him in his stupid face. And he, I, I tell him this all the time. He, you know, he, he, he like wants to be a man, like all young men. He's like, you know, and I want to have stories. And you're so cool because you guys have these stories and you've done these crazy things. And I'm like, don't worry, you'll get there. But here's what you need to do, buddy. You need to sit like every person in human history has sat in bed and you need to throw your phone away, like throw it, uh, you know, like plug it in on the other side of the room. I try to do this and this thing is such a ne nefarious little shit that it always navigates. It always like just migrates back to my bedside table. And this is an evil little time vampire monster that sucks life from me and, 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 and I need to keep it on the other side of the room, both because I snooze button like a, like a horrible, I hate myself from a snooze button usage, but also because it sucks up my time and energy and my attention right to the moment I fall asleep. Mm -hmm. And, and I think a part of what I remember so viscerally about being a younger man 
is I would sit there and I would like, I would sit there and just dream of like the kind of man that I wanted to be and the kind of life that I wanted to lead. And, and this is what I tell him. I'm like, man, you need to spend a lot of time dreaming. Spend a lot of time like in yearning, like with this intense desire, like a, 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 a hole you know, uh, that you're trying to fill something in the pit of your stomach, a rock in the pit of your stomach, that is this burning desire to do something great, to become something great, to develop into something wonderful. And, and, I, and I'm like, I, I worry that we are not doing that. I worry that I'm not doing that enough anymore. Sitting with that and, and not like, as soon as you and I get off this, you know, like I got a load of text messages and email and I'm going to, I'm not going to, you know, give this the reflective pause that it deserves. Instead, I'm going to go and, and start texting. And now that I've said this, I'm not going to do it. I accept the challenge. But it's like, it takes the little moments. And, and we need to reclaim those little moments. And we need to reclaim this time where we sit and we think and we, and we, and we feel, uh, 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 and we introspect about who we want to be and about what we screwed up. And, and it's only when you have nothing, you know, in the, in that 15 minutes before sleep takes you where your mind is free and open, you know? And, and I think that that's the biggest thing that I say to, to, to a younger man in that position is just like, you need, if you don't dream it, it's never going to be real. And you need to find that burning desire in you about who you want to be. And the more you do that, the better off you're going to be in life. And the less you do that, the more your life is going to be white. What a fucking brilliant way to finish. Yeah. <laughs> that was great. That was great. Best for last. Best for I, last. I love it. Signing off. Catch you later, guys. Thank you so much for tuning into another episode of A Lot To Talk About. It means the world that you guys are in my corner, that you continue to listen to the show every week. And if you could do me a massive favor by following the podcast on whichever platform you listen to it and sharing this episode in particular with just one friend that you feel would benefit from it, that would mean the world to me and it would help the show grow. The more the show grows, the bigger the guests we get on the more that we can do and the more we can share and support you guys, the listeners, the viewers of the show. Before I go, I want to pay my respects and recognize the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet and record this podcast. The Aboriginal culture has such a rich history in storytelling. And as a passionate storyteller, I really hope that the stories we share and connect with on the show can allow the many cultures that now call this beautiful land Australia their home to come together and continue to respect the stories and the culture that make this the land it is today. Thank you so much for tuning into A Lot To Talk About. I'll catch you next week. Mm -hmm.